Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the AWS Canberra Summit. I'm going to be one of your room hosts today, Timothy Mills. Um, to get us started today with the How CSIRO Speaks uh, Speeds Innovation with its Earth Observation Platform, we're going to introduce our guest speakers, Fabiana Santana and Dr. Robert Wood Woodcock. Uh, but first, an introduction from Fabiana. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians of this land. And uh, I'd like to pay my respects for their culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. And of course, uh, I'd like to acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending this session today. So welcome everyone, and let's get started. So today uh, we have a very good, great, entertaining, and also very smart guest speaker, guest speaker with Dr. Robert Woodcock here. I'll call him in a minute. And uh, Rob will tell us how Cyro it speeds innovation with its Earth Observation platform. So, uh, Robert is a CSIRO research consultant in Earth Analytics Infrastructures. And his portfolio of projects includes the development of the OSCOPE, National Data Infrastructure, and what he's going to talk about today the CSIRO Easy Earth Analytics Platform. Um, Rob also uh, has worked in, in has seen international application in, of his uh, results in industry, including Fortune 500 companies. And his focus is really to make sure that research innovation leads to business innovation. So how you close this gap? And also, how can you um, provide solutions that are useful for industry worldwide? Uh, Rob is also the, sh the chair of the CEO's working group on information systems and services, working with international agencies to simplify accessibility of Earth observation data globally. And well, uh, Today, Rob's solution will be based on the following AWS services. So for Compute, Easy's platform uses Amazon EC2, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, Amazon Elastic Container Registry. And then, of course, outscaling to make sure that he reaches the scale that he needs. Remember, uh, John was just talking to us here in this room. Earth observation data is, is usually we're talking about very, very large data sets. So you need this scale to, to do the ana analysis that you uh, need. Also, um, Rob's use Amazon RDS in easy solution for, um, as, as a database. Storage is basically Amazon S3 and Elastic File System. And then a, a couple of other services that are helpful in managing the Easy Platform, such as Cognito, CloudWatch, CloudFront, and AWS Data Pipeline. On top of that, there are also, of course, many security services that will be uh, discussed later today. So, well, without further ado, Rob, please. Thanks, Fabiana. Uh, so with an introduction that starts off that high um, in expectation, uh, it's great because it's all downhill from here, um, which is easier for me. Uh, and easier is going to be a pun you're going to hear a lot <laughs> as well. My apologies for that. I originally named this project, just as an aside, the Earth Analytics Virtual Laboratory. So think about that for a minute. Evil, yeah. And then, then I could have my evil empire and so forth, but I got shouted down. So we're going to have a little bit of chat, really, about uh, taking on a bit of a journey. Um, so the first thing to note, I'm not an Earth observation scientist. 
All right, I'm an IT specialist, a computer scientist. I do have a doctorate, Dr. Blah, which gives me permission to hang out with Earth observation scientists in the same way that drummers get to hang out with musicians. All right, so all good. <laughs> and uh, so I can talk a little bit about what we do at the CSIRO, how we use Earth observation information, or particularly how we traditionally use Earth observation information. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. Then I want to talk a little bit about how the situation has changed. How many people here were here for the previous talk with John Hildebrand? About half, okay, we'll touch on a few of the same topics, but we'll need to touch on it because about half of you are here. Um, so the, uh, we'll talk about the situation that's changed from two aspects for, for our science, what it means for our science teams, um, and what it means for the people that we serve, right? Whether that be customers um, who use our research or engage with our research um, um, and, and uh, use our science or commercialize our science, as the case may be, or through to government and government agencies, which is one of the roles that CSIRO plays um, with providing decision support. Um, we're going to talk about then how we responded to the situation changing um, and how we're trying to make our life easier, Earth Analytics Science Innovation, um, and the impact it's had. Actually, hear from some of our science teams and some of our customers have been using um, our activities. Now, I'm going to use the word customer, but it, it's, it's it, it, people we advise, people we sell to, people we do research consulting, collaboration, university. We have a wide variety of people that we work with um, in the organization. But I think the, the word customer has become infectious while I've been here at AWS uh, Summit. Um, who was there? Who's from Sydney? Yeah? Okay. And if you were from Canberra, you would have choked on the dust as it got on the way there. It wasn't quite as thick. Um, so this is the Sydney dust storm in September 2009. That's roughly what it looked like. Contrast on this screen is not too bad for seeing the picture. Anybody know where the dust came from? Want to guess? Just yell out. Central Australia. Central Australia. Well done. And in fact, you can see it. This is a Himawari 8 image. Uh, Himawari 8 is a satellite, takes a picture of, it's owned by the Japanese space agency, JAXA, takes a picture of half the planet, so full disk, half the planet, uh, roughly centered over Japan, um, and therefore covers Australia. Um, it's 500 meter resolution, takes a picture every 10 minutes. And you can see smack in the middle there, you can actually see there's cloud and then there's dust. It's a little hard to see on the projection, but hopefully you can see that. All right, so that's central Australia. Sydney is you can't see the coastline. It's actually under the cloud just here, right? So we're talking hundreds of kilometers, right, is where that came from. And the reason it came about was because of this. 2018 is on the right, 2009 is on the left. This is a fractional cover map or total cover analysis and offending all of my CSIRO scientists to build these things. I'm gonna say brown is dirt and green is grass. Okay, <laughs> it's not quite, but close enough. And as you can see, it's much deeper brown over here. So what do you say? You've got a continental map. Well, A, it needed to be continental, so we knew where the dirt came from, all right? B, we needed actual weather information to be able to work out that the dirt would be transported and where it would be transported to. Uh, C, we have a time series of this continent going back decades. Right? Which means we can do things like, we can look at how land management practices have been changing over time and whether or not that has any impact on how brown it goes or how green it goes. Or we can see the effect of temperature changes and droughts and flooding and so forth. We can see those effects by looking at the temporal history and we can use that to inform people on what land management practices actually work to reduce the dust content that gets dumped on Sydney. Why is that a problem to have dust dumped on Sydney? Cleanup costs estimated them to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's without taking into account the health effects that it would have had on some people. All right? So it does pay to figure out some of these things. You get it by combining satellite information, weather information, a ton of really cool science, and computers, which is the bit that I like. All right? So that's what we do in a nutshell. From paddock to planet, I love that phrase, across land and sea, that's where CSIRO works. We have a few hundred Earth observation-related scientists uh, working on a range of products. Um, the one you saw before was the Dust Watch system, which, by the way, is actually made available on a website. You can see dust predictions for Sydney um, in there. Um, but we also have algal bloom warning, looking at water quality in the systems. And we've got some upgrades we want to do to that. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And we have urban monitoring. And this, oddly enough, is not monitoring 
the roads and the houses, it's monitoring the trees. How many urban forests are there? Right? Do we have the trees healthy? Or do we have too few, too many, etc.? Um, it's a, a little uh, interesting project. That's actually over Perth. All right. So this traditionally is what we've been doing. Now, the trouble is, things changed. They changed in two areas. Firstly was the technical requirements for our activities. All right? um, we have more satellite data, a lot more satellite data. Before Himawari 8, you'd get roughly hourly data, one kilometer resolution. With Himawari 8, you're getting 500 meter or better and 10 minute or better resolution, temporarily. Plus more bands, so there's more actual optical bands being detected. Um, that's not just, a, you don't just take a curve that, or a line of data growth that's kind of on this angle and suddenly go, it's on this angle without wrecking your entire processing chain. All right? You've got to get that data out, processed, and do it all in 10 minutes instead of an hour. Um, and that's just one satellite, and they've more or less all done that. So we're not talking about like tsunami levels of things, we're talking tectonic shifts, entire planetary changes in terms of the amount of data that's now available. It's really cool for our science if we can exploit it. If we can exploit it, all right? That's the challenge there. For our clients, well, they were on the receiving end of the results of this. So they're getting data faster, there's more opportunities for them, but can they consume it, all right? Do they have access to a supercomputer? So these are questions we started asking ourselves. So the first thing to note, higher resolution in time, space, spectra, so the optical bands that you see, so your eyes and your TV set works with red, green, and blue for the most part. Um, but if you're dealing with um, imagery like this and you want to look at an algal bloom, the difference between a green algal bloom and a green algal bloom that will kill you all right, can be detected by getting some different spectral bands in the infrared range, right? There's an absorption feature that'll actually, the phytoplankton, there we go, it's a big word for the science teams. Everybody in my science team just fainted because I used a big word, all right? Um, so they, they have an actual absorption feature that they can detect that t tells you the difference between, you could, well, you could drink an algal bloom, you wouldn't want to drink an algal bloom if it was not harmful, but you can't do it if it's harmful, all right? There's a difference between those two that you want to know. And so if you've got the right, Spectra, you can actually detect that. Um, resolution, some of these images on the left here are actually sub-meter. Right? Can't quite read your newspaper, but can definitely tell it's your car. Right? Um, and hyperspectral more bands, so that's an image of a hyperspectral image there on the right. We also have new modalities. Radar's pretty popular. The reason why radar's pretty popular, uh, so this is optical imagery, this is radar. Um, over the same area, but during a flood, all these dark patches are relatively smooth because they're water, so you don't get as much reflection back from the radar that set the signal down, bounced it back off. If it's smooth, it'll bounce away, all right? So you get a dark patch. So it's great for water, but the other thing is it penetrates cloud, but it also penetrates, depending on the band, foliage. So you can actually bounce off the foliage at the top of the tree, or you can bounce off the trunks, or you can bounce off the ground depending on what uh, radar you're using. So that's great for doing things like working out the volume of biomass in your forest and how much carbon it's absorbing. So we've got new modalities coming along, which is great. And, uh, but all of those made more data. This, this is one of our scientists, I'm sure of it. That's what they look like. It's also one of our customers. <laughs> that's what they look like. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful having all this data, but if you can't use it, if you don't know how to use it, Right, and Earth observation scientists are not computer scientists. All right, let me change that. Observation, Earth observation scientists do not know how to use computers. All right. <laughs> you can tell I'm really popular in my organization. Um, no, they do, but they're just not in the same way that an IT specialist would, right? So it's a different, different way of approaching um, the cuning problem. We need to deal with that. For industry, we, we went out and talked to 50 of our customers and said, hey, how are you going? They said, uh, actually, we hate the upfront cost of organizing data. Um, we don't own a supercomputer. Small, single-person consulting company don't own a supercomputer. Um, there's lots of, to lots of, like this one, large choice of algorithms, all right? Uh, I, can make, I can write you a machine learning algorithm and save you a billion dollars on your next mining venture, right? 
you should, you should invest in me. I'll, I'll only charge $100,000. Who's going to give me $100,000? All right? Now, the issue is there's 10,000 people saying that. Which of those techniques works? All right? So there's a risk management issue around doing R&D in this space because there's so many choices all right, that you can't actually <laughs> you can't even make that decision. So there's a very hard way to, to deal with that. So we thought, OK, we need to do something about these challenges. It's too hard for our clients. It's too hard for us. There's so much data. And, and really, I have to say, there is so much data. You, you really have to have looked at what was happening over the last few years. We've collected more satellite data about this planet in the last few years than we did in the previous three decades. All right? It's absolutely astonishing. Um, and so that leads to issues with computational scale. The beautiful thing is we looked at ways of changing our client engagement, um, and that's what Easy's about. Um, we looked at using cloud computing. I asked myself the question, what would happen if I gave all of our Earth observation scientists access to 5,000 core computers on demand? Every single one of them gets a 5,000 core computer when they want it. They don't have to wait. They don't have to use a share. They don't have to queue. They can just interactively say, I want a 5,000 core computer because I feel like trying this new science algorithm I've just come up with. I just want to try it and see if it works because that's what science is, is exploration of what you're doing. So I asked the question, what would happen if you did that? And I used somebody else's credit card, which was even better. Right. Um, Analysis-ready data is a phrase that's used when you get data from a satellite, the original data is actually what the sensor sees. So it's on the top of the atmosphere, and it's what the sensor actually sees. Um, what you do when you process it is you correct for all of the atmosphere-y stuff, right, which is distorting what the sensor sees relative to what's on the ground. And then you actually have to work out, is the satellite pointing at the same place all right, and align it spatially? And then you have to correct for the return trip when it comes back up through the atmosphere to get to the sensor. And that'll give you, for an optical satellite, surface reflectance information. Right? So you actually have to get that done. Analysis-ready data is that process, getting it to that point where you can just use it as surface reflectance. Right? Um, you need to be a physicist to do that sort of stuff, um, from what I'm told. Uh, I don't understand those guys. They're too clever. Um, we use analysis-ready data, and we remove the heavy lifting uh, of accessing the compute capacity through our system. This was our opportunity, and that is what we did. So really, the solution is easy uh, in our case, um, and it really seeks to address those technical challenges around so much more data, so many more modalities, so many more pieces of research to explore, right? new ways of things to try on much more data. right? Um, and also our ability to get those solutions into the hands of our customers of all kinds. So the innovation hub, or easy, is actually a highly scalable. Um, it literally is thousands of core per user that it's capable of. Um, and it provides a multi-sensor integration environment. And that includes not only the multiple satellite sources, that are whizzing around, but also in situ sensors that are on the ground to help calibrate and validate those sources. Right? So we have that whole system available in an integrated environment. Because we do not know, it's science, if we, if it was, we wouldn't be doing research if we knew how we were going to join this all together. Right? So because we don't know a priori how that will all come together to produce an outcome, that's the research, we provide an exploratory data analytics environment, which is this thing here. It's Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebooks are wonderful things if you haven't seen them before. There are sections that are just text where you can actually write your research paper. It's kind of cool, properly documented. Um, and there are sections that are code. And the code will actually execute. Uh, and this particular one's running, it's actually spun up a cluster. So it's run up a, um, it's a well, no, can't remember. How many cores have I got? 80. So it's got a half a terabyte of RAM and 80 cores. Um, and it's running through a processing job um, over some area, I can't remember where. Um, and it's just processing it all out. So this is a single user, just comes in, logs in, goes in, starts building their notebook, writes down what they're doing for their science so the next person can read it, runs up a cluster temporarily, because they fancy one with 80 cores, and gets on with the job. And it just plugs out the results. 
And the code's relatively simple to write. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but you do get there. All right? um, so it's very flexible in the sense that it is a data analytics environment. All right? So this is not a point and click website. This is supporting exploratory data analysis through the Jupyter interface. We have other interfaces in Easy that support point and click and web maps and dashboards and so forth. All those other things exist. All right? um, and we actually only pay for what I use. We can actually tell what each individual user and the project they have been running on has actually been using in terms of resources. And that's important for our project managers because they're able to look at these things and say, ah, if I run this job that I just did on a paddock on Tasmania instead of just a paddock, um, it's going to cost about this much money, right? Because they can see as they go, they've got that feedback all the time coming through. So really, this type of environment allows us to get our CSIRO science done more quickly, um, and our algorithms get faster to where our customers can use them. So one of the libraries we use, I want to give a shout out to Geoscience Australia here. We did a collaboration with Geoscience Australia around a thing called the Open Data Cube. Um, this is how we actually produce some of the analysis-ready data and make it easier to do. The killer app for the Open Data Cube is a single command that goes datacube.load. That's the killer app. It loads a cube in space and time and satellite sensor type, so bands in the case of a spectral band, um, and allows us to do this kind of continental scale processing if we want to. All right. Or we can just do a paddock. But it's literally the, the killer app is datacube.load. That's the entire beauty of it all. The fact that when you go datacube.load on our system, it looks through 2 million files and figures out how to stack them up over time and spatially align them and load them all into a distributed cluster with 5,000 cores so that you can actually do this calculation right, is completely hidden from most of our Earth observation scientists. All right. They just go load, enter. And they go, add this number to that number. Or do some funky, sophisticated, physics-based um, um, control analysis of a gigantic time series of data. All right? So this is a really neat, amazing piece of work um, done with our, some of our colleagues from Geoscience Australia. They did the lion's share of this. That was really good fun. Um, and I, I continue to be amazed by, by people being amazed by going data cube at load. Um, they used to download every file manually from a website. All right, can you imagine? In New South Wales coast, Landsat 8 alone is 3,600 files. Can you imagine? Website load, download, to website load, download. To. Then you've got to stack them up all over time. Now I can just go datacube.load an entire continent. This is awesome. All right. Um, so really, when we talk about acceleration in the innovation life cycle for us, you can see here, this is typically what happens. Um, and I want to just briefly touch on this again. So we start with a notebook. We'll do a small area of interest. We'll start at, say, paddock scale. We'll spin up a, um, what, I, what I would call a small cluster, but most of our scientists actually find quite large, uh, about an 80 core cluster. We have trouble getting our scientists to use more computing resources, right? <laughs> our Earth observation scientists, they're not used to it. They're used to download. They're used to laptops. They're not used to necessarily pushing out, all right? So we've had to encourage them, all right? Just use 10. Why? Because that gives you 80 cores and it goes faster. All right. 80 cores is pretty simple. You can process Tasmania for 20 years without any trouble at all on that kind of a cluster. All right. And you don't even have to think about it. It's nice. You have to think a bit more when you do a continent. Anyway, they'll do that. Then they'll do some visualization. Most of the visualization is interactive. Um, you can't tell from this image, but this you can actually visualize the entirety of Tasmania with a 20-year thing in real time because all the data is on the cluster. All right? And so the cluster will actually compute and send you the 800 by 800 pixels that are on this screen. It doesn't send you the one terabyte of data that was actually there to your web browser. All right? Although I have accidentally sent 32 gigabytes of data to my web browser on my home PC, uh, which was interesting, to say the least, to my NBN connection. But that's not where we stop. Once we're happy with paddocks working, they want to be able to do this. So this is actually a piece of work from a group uh, that works on bushfires. It's National Bushfire Intelligence Capability. Runs in CSIRO. Um, in this particular case, we have at the top a height map, a digital elevation model. So that's um, lighter colors are higher, darker colors are lower. Um, you can understand why the Nullarbor Plain is called the Nullarbor Plain when you look at that. 
right? <laughs> this nice big flat spit. Um, but fires don't care about height, fires care about slope. So this is actually a slope map. It's at 30 meter resolution for the entire continent. Right? So they need to actually compute that as quickly as they can for doing their bushfire analysis work. All right? Now, trouble is, I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable calculation. There's a lot of work that goes into doing that. All right? However, in reality, bushfires don't just care about slope. They care about plants and prevailing wind. And in the future, they will care about the, the forecast for climate change because that's going to have an impact on the way fires spread. And they care about urban areas, and people care about burning down houses and the impact on habitat and ecosystems. So in practice, the bushfire intelligence capability doesn't have a one map of Australia, of slope. It has all of these. In fact, there are more than these. I didn't put them all on here. So these are all continental level calculations taken from satellite, weather, climate projection information, all being combined together in order to provide you um, with a prediction of what fire risk there are in various scenarios for climate change in the future to help with planning in government, right, and urban areas and businesses and farms and so forth, right? So it's a decision support tool. This is a massive calculation. It requires, because I'm told, I don't know the math myself, you need actually the time series from the last like 20 odd years of weather data, 360,000 time slices for the continent. You need 30 meter resolution. You need six, you need to multiply that by six climate change scenarios, right? And I think there's 14 or so families of fire scenarios. And apply it to your custom weather, um, to custom vegetation map because the vegetation maps are collected by states. Right? So you can do the math. Right? That's a lot of computation that needs to be orchestrated. Easy supports this kind of scale up. Right? And in practice, Easy ends up being shown as this. I am a cloud computing engine. On it is a ton of really cool science and math. This is what our science teams care about, right? getting this bit right. I care about this bit. I want this bit to work. And those people, all of our different users, care only about what they get to see at the end or some intermediate stage when they interact with the system. Right? So we're talking about orchestrating a massive amount of data through a massive amount of compute to perform a whole range I think last count there were about 35 different processing algorithms involved. Um, and to do this repeatedly and regularly every quarter so that these people can make better decisions about the future and handling fires. Yeah. So the scale here is extraordinary and this is just one of our projects. And so Easy was built to really remove this part because most of this part is very, very common across all of the projects that work at this part. And so we're taking the undifferentiated heavy lifting out of our science team's hands. We're taking the knowledge of having to worry too much about how you get access to a HPC or a large cluster of computers, um, or how you get access to the data, the analysis-ready data that you need, and just making it easily findable. Um, so to do that, I'm not going to go into the architecture in much more detail. I'll simply say at a high level, we place all of our applications running in a Kubernetes service, which is on Amazon EKS. We have a number of orchestration engines that are available in, in this environment and our analysis ready data. And all of this connects into the physical infrastructure of AWS underneath through their services. Um, and it works really, really well um, for us. There are some challenges around managing it uh, in the sense that there are hundreds to thousands of running components in the system. And we need to make sure it's all secure, it scales with demand, it shuts down, it gets, gets those users that forget to turn the computer off for the entire weekend and it's connected to a 2,000 core cluster. We get them to turn off by themselves so that users, we don't have to rely on users. Um, and we need to do updates and this is relentless. Kubernetes alone is updated quarterly in an hour environment with the innovation that we do. Across the entire ecosystem, it pays to be updating quarterly, which is absolutely relentless. 
all right? Um, but doable. And we need to do this with a few people, not an army, because if the number of engineers outweighs the number of scientists, there'll be war in CSIRO. Right. So um, I'm going to skip this one for the moment in the interest of time. Um, what I can say is that the easy infrastructure is code, which connects through and creates all the AWS services and deploys all the applications. It's fully automated. We can go from nothing, a blank AWS account, to a fully working, secure, continental scale processing system with access to data in AWS in under a day. In fact, my record is four hours. And I suspect I could do it in two. All right? That is, from a straight up infrastructure point of view, build an entire data center <laughs> in two hours. It's astonishing. I love this tech. All right? Just makes it so much easier. And it's all fully automated. If you're using ClickOps, you're wrong. <laughs> right? If you're clicking on web pages to launch stuff, you're wrong. It's just as simple as that. Get into this stuff. Infrastructure code. There's several options for it. But what about the impact? Enough talking about me. I've made it all sound really nice. Well, this is some quotes from our um, team. This is Kimberly Opie. She works in the Bushfire team. Um, as you can see, it's made the seemingly impossible achievable again. And she wasn't kidding when she said that. She, she genuinely meant it. Um, their team actually got a productivity award um, for one of their product deliverables. And the reason they contacted me afterwards, and they said, you should be on here, uh, because um, the reason they got the award is they were able to do multiple iterations, that exploratory part of data analysis, um, on easy several times, in, and it was roughly the same length of time they would have spent in the queuing system on our standard CSIRO HPC system. So the queuing system doesn't do any work, right? You're just sitting there waiting, right? So they did multiple iterations because they had an on-demand capability at scale capable of exploring their, their, their research problem, right? Huge um, achievement for them, um, and they're really happy now. Um, this is another project, um, Jin Tang. Um, this region here is just a zoomed in on a, on a river system. The actual area that they're processing, this is floodwater depth. Um, it has, from memory, daily data for the entire, entirety of the Murray-Darling Basin. Now, if you don't know how big the Murray-Darling Basin is, imagine Australia. Imagine about a quarter of that. That's the Murray-Darling Basin. All right? It's massive. Because right? uh, it's the catchment area. It's where, wherever the rain falls and runs down the hill, into the Murray River. That's the Murray-Darling Basin. Right? Basin, like you have go in the bathroom. Right? It's where the water falls. So this is huge. And what was really gratifying to see, and this is a lovely side effect to having Easy as a platform that people can use, is not only can they do that calculation, which they do on about 1,000 cores on a regular basis, um, one of the other teams picked it up and used that result to work out with some ecosystem stuff where water birds breed. So there's a map of where the favorable conditions are for water birds to breed in, which is useful for planning and environment change and so forth. So that's pretty cool. Um, we're now embarking on some new projects, AquaWatch Australia. Uh, this is a national um, project we're looking at. Um, it's in the pre-launch phase at the moment, still designing the project plans. Um, and it's powered in part by uh, the EASY system. Um, but, and potentially has a set of custom sovereign Australian Earth observation satellites, our first ones, which would be really cool. All right, so there's, we're looking at, and the reason why we're having our own is because you need those like harmful algal bloom detecting things. You need the right resolution to get into our tiny little rivers and so forth. Um, so we're looking at this at the moment. Um, and that also includes a lot of ground IO2 sensors. You can see a little boy up there with one of our hydrospectors sitting on it, which provides calibration information to validate what the satellites are seeing um, in the water. So that's an interesting place. Um, not just Earth observation. We do a bunch of work in minerals as well, so the mineral resources team. Uh, my colleague Sam is actually here in the audience at the moment. And uh, they have started publishing um, out uh, some of their exploration tools. This one's used for uh, segmenting drill core information into regions and blocks, which are basically rock type, um, through, the, through the drill core. Um, and they're putting those services out through EASY because the EASY system is a production system. Not only do we use it for our research, it's actually a production capable cluster. It's got self-healing, it's got security, it's got all of those lovely things, backups that you need in the back end deployed into it. So EASY has had an interesting side effect. 
in that we've been using it to provide R&D for us and to our clients through consulting projects, but we've had some clients come back and say, I want an easy two. All right. And so we've actually started looking at making easy available to clients through an enterprise system where we actually help them manage the system. Not many people are very familiar with large-scale Earth observation processing environments, so we give them a hand <laughs> and we work with them. Um, we also make it available through subscription, through a shared tenancy, which is very handy for smaller enterprises um, and single consultants as well. Uh, so this is a bit of an experiment from our point of view, um, making these services available out there, but it means that our R&D gets into their hands faster because they have an environment in which they can run it once the research project is finished. Right? And one of the delightful things is we actually ended up with a Fortune 500 company um, getting involved. I can't say who. Um, and I'll just skip that one. Um, their comment was that the performance of Easy Hub and the engineering support <laughs> um, received, met, and in some cases exceeded our expectations. They are actually very, very happy. Unfortunately, I can't tell you who they are. It's commercial in confidence. Um, but uh, they are processing um, roughly a quarter to a third of the United States um, of satellite information from the past 30 odd years to do some stuff that I'm not allowed to tell you what it is, but it's very cool and it involves machine learning amongst other things um, and it requires that time series analysis to be done. Um, and they're able to do it faster and cheaper and from, a, from our perspective in CSIRO it's great because they have really, really rich commercial data sets. So we get to play with their commercial data sets and deal with the science. It's really improving our understanding of how things do stuff that I'm allowed to mention. <laughs> but it really helps our science to have that level of engagement. Um, and we've had multiple R&D activities with them as well, which has been fantastic as well. So really, Easy's brought us a bit on a journey. We started out with a situation where we get data from um, various satellite providers around the world. Each of our projects would do their own individual thing. And then we'd have to custom build something if a customer actually wanted it. And that was painful and awkward and became impossible as the volumes of data involved uh, improved. The beauty of having easy with the open data cube and the cloud analytics and the analysis ready data, it's now really simple. A few hours, you get an easy running right? to get one up, which is great. But I think the really the most important part for us has been the improvement that it's made to our science teams and this interaction we have with our clients. We are much more rapidly, we can get information from our lab into the hands of people who are then using it to really build value for the nation. And that's what I like about it. It's this part here where all these people are playing together and leveraging and they're not flapping around with computers. Right? They're actually getting on with doing the job that they're employed for and interacting with each other. So that's what Easy enables us to do. And the cloud and so forth is just a way to enable us to do that, which we did not have before. So thank you. Fabiano. So uh, thank you, Rob. Another great talk as usual. Uh, we have time for one question, perhaps two. Any questions from the audience? So it, it actually, orchestration is a really interesting question. So the, the Kubernetes layer is primarily around um, dealing with the, the orchestration, but there are different things that need to be orchestrated in different ways. All right. So for during the exploratory data analytics phase, um, we use uh, a library called Dask. Uh, Dask actually has a Kubernetes um, native um, version to it. What Dask does is it allows you to run Python parallel programs um, on arrays. So it'll take a, an array, which I mean, if you took Australia <laughs> and you chopped it up into blocks and put that out on several hundred thousand computers, right? Um, that's Dask does that orchestration. It splits it out and allows that calculation to be run distributed. So during exploratory data analysis, a lot of our science teams use Dask to do that because it's nice and straightforward. The interface is easy to use. It scales pretty well, all right? Um, and they, that, so that's one orchestrator in the system. So it's Dask and its flavor of doing things working with Kubernetes to spin up the resources. And so ultimately underneath, it'll spin up an EC2 instance through EKS to get that EC2 instance. That's just one example. 
In the production runs, things like the NBIC system, when you've got the really big system, you need a different kind of orchestrator. Because when you're doing that run, you want it to restart on fail and, and fail over. So if there's an error issue with downloading data, you want it to actually <laughs> wait to retry. If you want to control the price of the run, you want it to wait until the spot price in AWS for an EC2 instance has dropped low enough rather than executing. So you've got a different kind of orchestration. And for that, we use things like Argo workflows. Um, we've got some Lambda stuff in there. So we actually have multiple orchestration engines. Uh, personally, I like the way Kubernetes operates. It provides a, an abstraction layer um, to allow you to have custom operators, which then ultimately map down to the AWS services underneath. But it means you can have different flavors of orchestrators depending on what you're trying to do, um, while still leveraging um, a lot of the stuff that Kubernetes does really well around resilience and so forth. So is that OK? Brilliant. So, look, if you were interested in this talk, and I'm sure you were, at, at least you was amazing. Thank you, Rob. Uh, please join us at the, uh, we have more than 500 free digital resources for learning. So if you are interested, please join us and start learning today. And if you want to, you know, um, assess your certifications, you can also uh, go in to one of our certification options. Um, and, whoa. And please complete this session server for uh, this talk. So we really appreciate your feedback and we use that to improve our future sessions. Uh, also, um, I think next we have the keynote, right? So. Uh, after the session, I think I have a short break. And it's, uh, actually next door as well. Yeah, okay. So a short break and then the keynote. Thank you very much. Have a good day at the summit. Bye -bye.